So it's a best question. So in a best question, of course, I'm looking at what is the, the best thing to do. That means there can be more than one good thing to do. Okay. So um, if I'm not sure what to do, because I'm a non physical social worker and I don't know how, I'm going to look at what I do. So I'm going to rule out, first of all, rule out some, some things. Um, D, mobility of both arms and legs given the physical limitations. I, I missed that day where I should have learned physical therapy, so I can't assess that one. Nope. Okay. C, need for physical therapy given the accident occurred early in the life course. He might need that, but again, I'm a school social worker. I don't get to guess that one. So now I'm down to A or B. So special physical accommodations required in school to facilitate maximal independence or B, impacts on the student's social, psychological, and social, uh, student psychological and social functioning. Pretty sure that I can't, I'm not the school facility coordinator either. I can't build a ramp, I can't do any of those things. And yes, the ADA does say that needs to happen, and yes, I can be an advocate for his family, but my job is to make sure that I'm looking at what's best for the student, and that's the psychological or social functioning. Make sense? Um, 30, this is a common question I've seen on, a, on all levels. The supervisor tells us we're going to monitor the situation and tells and keep the supervisor informed if any subsequent allegations are made by the teenager. Going to report it anyway. It is my license that I worked hard to get. I am reporting that no matter what my supervisor said. That's on me. Um, I just want to touch on 32. Harm reduction. Harm reduction is the fact that everyone doesn't need to be abstinent, that we that clients can use and use safely. So that goes aligned with the social workers code of ethics that talks about client self-determination. So if a client is not ready to quit and abstinence is not their goal, we support that. So if you see the client, she's, you know, she's 25 and she's an alcohol or she drinks alcohol and um, she wants to go out and party tonight. Uh, what is a harm reduction method? Getting her a cab home, finding her babysitter, all of those things. Because we're going to work within the client self-determination, her choice, her choice. So harm reduction is people that we don't believe in abstinence you can use. We're just going to teach you to be safe while you use. And of course, it's um, needle exchange. I'm sorry, needle exchange is harm reduction, okay? Um, so DUI classes are harm reduction. It doesn't say don't drink. It says don't drink and drive, okay? So remember, harm reduction is totally different than abstinence, okay? And if you see that AA question, you know, AA is not a faith-based group. It is God as you see God. So remember, if you see that, you see the client's AA, it is God as you see God. Those 12 sessions. You just might see a 12, uh, 12 step plan, 12 step program. Go down and pick up some of these. Okay, 70. It's made at a local restaurant. Is that okay? That is D. I'm going to disagree. It's just another location that's not so public, right? Okay. So, again, that's client confidentiality. 
that is the largest concern of the, the largest violation of code of ethics is confidentiality. Okay. Look at number 71. She's using a behavioral approach. When I'm thinking of my behavior, so I'm thinking of Pavlov or Skinner, I'm thinking of rewards and consequences. You get my bell. It is D. It is D. Oh, bell's not going there. Okay. So let's look at why it's D. So during the assessment, the social worker's question will focus on identifying what. I know it's a behavioral approach, right? Defense mechanisms are Freud, right? It, ego, super ego, unconscious, Freud, all of those things. The age at which the stress occurred. That might be some kind of developmental approach, right? Looking at how old they were, maybe even Erickson. Psychological reasons for the stress. Behavioral people don't care. They don't care how sad you are, how happy you are. They just really don't care. Identification of antecedents that precede the behavior. So remember, we're looking at A, B, C. That is the antecedent, what happened before the behavior, the actual behavior, and the consequences. And if I can change either A or C, the assumption is that the behavior will change, right? Change it by positive or negative reinforcement, positive or negative consequences, and I can figure out what happened before the behavior, and therefore I can change the behavior. A, B, C, and a C is what comes first. Good, good job there. Okay. I'm going to go a little off topic there. Um, but when we were talking about research designs, and I see reminded me of this, make sure that you know your single subject design. That is your AB, AB, right? Okay. Single subject design is to be used with a single client or a single group. That is my single subject design. The question, if you have the question, um, you're doing a research program, research evaluation in a clinical setting, what type of research can you use that is always quasi? Okay, it's unethical to do anything but a quasi-experimental approach. So what quasi means is it is not randomized. In order to have a true experiment, I have to have a control group, I have to have an experimental group, and they have to be randomized, right? Control group gets nothing, they may get a placebo or a nocebo, and then my other group, they get the drug, okay? So that is my, that is, that's a true experiment in a, non experiment I'm sorry, in a quasi, they're not randomized. So people can't come to therapy thinking they're getting treatment and they're not because they're in a quasi survey. So quasi, quasi experimental is always the answer when you're looking at the research program, how to do, how to buy with the research program, not the ABAB, because a lot of people always tell me this one. So ABA, single subject design, intervention, baseline intervention, okay? You do it all the time with your clients. They come in, they present with the problem. You take the intervention, you're looking at the information. We'll go home and try this. That's my assessment and come back. That's my intervention. A, B, A. Got it? Okay. The best way though is to repeat it. Intervention, baseline, come back in. Let me take an, I'm sorry, baseline. My client comes in, they're presenting with this problem. An intervention, I tell them CBT, go home and do some things like that. Come back, take a baseline, let's see how it worked. If it worked or didn't work, then we can do another intervention. Maybe it's repeat the session of CBT or try some gestalt or some Freudian theory, right? AB, AB design, that is single subject design. It can be used with a single subject or a single group of people. Okay, let's look at 72. In order to address the power imbalance and the systemic racism that are the roots of economic and social injustice, community question, community question. All the following except, so three of these things I'm gonna do, one I'm not.
A. Okay, so that is correct. So start from the bottom. D, acknowledge that racism has a negative impact on all races. Yes. B, recognize that racism is the glue that holds classism, poverty together, and it maintains the structures. Yes. B, understand how social program maintains poverty and institutional structures that limit across, uh, limit access to wealth. Correct. So colorblind theory means I don't see color. That's that universalist approach that everybody's the same and we don't want to ever use that approach, right? We want to see clients as different. We want to um, be uh, very uh, aware of the differences that clients bring. So um, a couple of terms, culture encapsulation. That means I can only see the world through my bubble. I don't understand how a different culture does something else or why they behave that way or why aren't they just doing like I do because I only see it from my cultural viewpoint. Okay, a couple other terms you might see is emic and etic. Okay, these are my, those um, uh, areas on uh, diversity. So etic viewpoint is I can see the world only from my viewpoint. Emic is I'm able to see it from the client's viewpoint. So when COVID hit China, we had a very ethic of your point, didn't we? Because it was them over there. And all if they would just wash their hands, we wouldn't have any problems. But then when it happened here, it became emic. Oh my gosh, it's about us. Okay, so emic really is you're looking at studies, behavior from within the system. Okay examines one culture, um, the structure identified by the analyst. So the emic view, you're looking from the cultural viewpoint. The etic view is you're looking at the, from the outside viewpoint. So not being a part of that culture. So etic is, I don't, I don't understand why they do that. Like, oh, those people, that's, my, that's a research term, it's emic, is I'm looking at it from the client's viewpoint. Okay, and ethnography, is another term that you might see there, and ethnocentrism, that believes that I believe my ethnicity is the center, right? So those are all terms that you might see under that. And one of the other things that you make sure you need to know is in the Afghar book as well, is that racial identity model. Okay, you'll see some questions on like how those, um, a client is in this stage or this stage of the racial identity model. Okay. So um, again, so this is where acculturation and assimilation come in, right? Acculturation is, I've got my culture, and then we're, we're Chinese, we move to the US, we add a culture, and we then add them both. That's acculturate. At school, I dress like the, the American kids, but at home, we still have a traditional indigenous Chinese or Japanese food, right? Whatever my culture is. Assimilate means I look as similar as everybody else. So then, you know, a question the, the Japanese boy goes home and he back talks his grandmother, he has assimilated because he's acting like every little American kid. Because in Japanese culture, that would never be acceptable. So assimilation and acculturation things that you might see also. And again, so these are those terms, pre-encounter, encounter, immersion, internalization. They are in APGAR also. Um, so if you're not, I can put that link to this in your chat box. Um, but those are just the stages of racial development. So you'll see those kind of, of Johnny has done this and he's done that. What, what stage is he in now? Okay. Seventy-four. Let's look at this one. Community question. The community has a number of problems, including rampant drug addiction, high crime rate, and poor school achievement. In order to assist, the social worker should first. What should she do first? The first question always tells me, I kind of gather information. Are there any questions I can ask before I intervene? If not, I may just have to intervene. What do you do first? That is my C, exactly. I'm going to talk to the community. It's their community. I don't get to decide. That's called partialization, remember? 
So we're gonna break it up in parts and pieces, but the community decides, not me. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, you might see this one also. Sometimes you get a few of those drug questions on there. Look at 75. For both physical and psychological withdrawal symptoms, exactly. So normally we don't think of cannabis pot as having some some of those symptoms, but she's used it. Um, um, she's only been clean two days after heavy and prolonged use of several years. So her most likely to experience is, okay, you got it. Seventy six. These are those active listening skills. Okay, those are on all the tests, active listening. A client who says she loves her job now reports that she's quitting because she can't stand it anymore. Sales worker replies, that's surprising because you've always said that you were happy there. This statement is what? 76, what is she doing? When you're using reflection, it is always, always about um, Feelings. You're going to give feelings back. Reflecting means that I didn't, um, the client didn't give me feelings, so I'm going to give them back some feelings. So if I'm telling you what a bad day I had, and I don't, I don't, and you can say, "Wow, well, Pam, it seems like you're sad." If I'm wrong, if you're wrong, girl, I will correct you. Right. So active listening skills. Validation is I'm, yeah, hey, you're right. It must have been a bad day. Interpretation. Interpretation. So he says that's surprising because you, you said you were hurt here. You said you were happy there. That's not quite interpretation. That's a nice way of confronting. How about that? And you know, we never confront. That's not what we do. Okay. So confronting is not what we do. So normally, right? I'm always looking for like a drug or alcohol question. And this one, she's confronting her. She's not interpreting. She's not validating. She's like, but you said you liked it there. Okay? So be careful because most often we're going to see those with drug questions, but occasionally we would confront. 77, that's one of my defense mechanisms. What do I do with that one? A client gets into a fight with his wife and buys her flowers and a ring several days later. These gifts are examples of what? That is undoing. You got it. You got it. Symbolization is like my, my tattoo. That's a symbol of something, right? Um, the ring. I'm not married, but that wedding ring is a symbol of something. That's symbolization. Reaction formation, of course, is I'm going to form a reaction totally different than what, I, um, I, what I'm feeling. So I, I go and harass gay people because I'm really attracted to gay people. Forming a reaction totally different than how I feel. Okay, so then um, um, reaction pro projective identification. Um, so so those are kind of two different things to project, right? That's you know projection, and then identification is when I overly identify with a title most often. If every time you see me, I say, "Hi, I'm Dr. Pam. I'm Dr. Pam. I'm Dr. Pam. What'd you do today? I'm Dr. Pam." And then you identify with a, a title most often, right? If you ask me who I am, I say, I'm a mom, I've got kids, I've got all these things. That's not, I don't identify myself as my label. Um, and number 76, that answer was D. That was D. And 77 is B, that is undoing. They got into a fight and he's trying to fix it like it didn't happen. Like, you know, little um, Jeannie with her little wrinkle on her nose. It didn't happen. Okay. 78, look at this one. Ah. 
78 is B because that belongs to Piaget. Exactly, Piaget, and that is in his sensory motor period, SPCF. Got it, got it, got it. 79, which of the following actions is the most critical when using an empowerment approach with a client? Remember, our job is to teach clients how to fish, not to give them a fish, okay? Teach clients how to fish, not to give them fish, okay? And I have a question to, to um, um, explain project projection. If you remind me of that, I'll go over all the defense mechanisms, okay? Just remind me of that one, okay? So empowerment, most often I'm thinking of the feminist therapy approach. And for those of my LCSW people, feminist therapy is not just for women, it's you're empowering any client. It's people who feel like they don't have power in society and you're trying to empower them, okay? So that's, my, uh, my, that's what it's for. So what following actions is most critical and it's A. I'm helping, I'm helping my client learn the skills to, to solve future problems, teaching them how to fish. That's what we do. Eighty. After completion and assessment, a client is placed in an intensive outpatient program, as opposed to an inpatient program for his substance abuse disorder. This decision is most likely based on what? Level of care, you got it. So that is utilization. So, you know, someone works at this big old utilization review board, and when you're in private practice, especially my LCSWs, you call in and you're looking for um, more sessions for your clients. So my utilization review, they do that, but it's based on their level of care, okay? My MSE, let's look at that one, mental status exam. Um, so you're going to use that one all the time, I mean, not all the time, but many times you've probably had one uh, administered to you, especially if you had a concussion or a car accident or anything like that. I'm trying to see kind of where you're at, um, person, place, thing, all those good things, right? some windows here. So when I'm looking at my um, MSE, it's my mental status exam, and I'm looking at the person, their current state of functioning, kind of where they're at right now. Uh, many times we'll look at um, someone who's schizophrenic, um, people who are um, Okay, so person, place, thing, um, their speech, their appearance. Sometimes you'll see the word gait, G-A-I-T. Gait is how they walk. Okay, so if you're not sure of that term, G-A-I-T is gait. Do they have a straight gait, a crooked gait? Their appearance, their effect and mood, their thought and perception. They're having logical thoughts, racing thoughts, attitude and insight. Okay, so my MSE exam, um, there's a mini MSE, it's short and sweet, okay, but that's um, what we're going to look for as you're looking at how they are cognitively right at this moment when, they, when they're in front of you. Let's get some windows there. Okay. I'm going to do some out of this one. 
you've got already done this one already, but working at the clinical level as well. Um, in general, APGAR is amazing for content, absolutely amazing for content. Not always the best for the first and next. So I have people who, you know, study forever and forever on the first and next. I mean, on, um, I'm sorry, who study forever and forever on um, using APGAR. Um, it's GAIT, G-A-I-T. That is uh, how you walk. Okay. There was a crooked man who walked a crooked mile. He had a crooked sixpence. He walked a crooked style. Something, something, something. Crooked gate, crooked, I don't know. It's G-A-I-T. It's the way you walk, though. Okay. Let's go to 113. Which of the following statements about social worker interviews is not true? Which is not true? So which are those not true questions? I'm looking for three of them that are correct and the one that is not. Okay, and B, they are uniform in nature in order to collect consistent information on all clients. So we do have forms that are consistent, but overall my interviews are not gonna be the same thing, right? Because every client is different. So that is correct, B is not true. 114, those are my stages of change, right? So pre-contemplation, I haven't even thought about it. Contemplation, that's um, I maybe. And it was actually, you know, it was made for uh, drug users, but I think it's um, all the women that I know at least um, have gone through these stages. It's called the trans, -ther trans, -ther trans theoretical um, model of change, that's what it's called. Again, it was started for uh, drug users. So my first one, of course, is, what do you mean I have a problem? Okay, well, I don't know what you're talking about. Of course I don't have a problem. But again, I use it for, um, it's easier for me to understand when I talk about it through how, how my friends and I attempt to lose weight. So pre-contemplation, you know, spring's coming up and I'm thinking, oh, hey, let me throw on this cute little skimpy dress. And my friend says, oh, Pam, I don't think that fits. I'm like, what are you talking about? I haven't gained any weight over the winter. It looks great. Oh my gosh, you, this must be you. I don't know what you're talking about. No idea. Contemplation is like, okay, the next day I try to put on a pair of jeans and I'm like trying to zip them up. Oh, okay. Maybe I've gained weight. Just maybe. I'm aware of the problem, but I'm not ready to change yet. Maybe it's just those jeans, right? Okay. Five or six pair of jeans later that I'm thinking, hmm, bam, let's do something about this weight. So preparation, I'm going Weight Watchers, I'm going, I'm trying the gym, as if they have a special nutrient system, Who, who's got the deal, right? I'm preparing. Then I'm going to start an action. I'm going to start my weight loss program, okay? I'm going to the gym every morning at 5 a.m. I'm going to work out every single day, get all my stuff done, right? Then you're going to maintain or relapse. So for most of my friends, uh, we relapse quite quickly. We go right back to where we were. Okay, when you relapse, that you don't go back to pre-contemplation or contemplation because now you're aware there's a problem. So when you relapse, you actually go back to preparation. You make a new plan um, or a new action. Okay, so those are my trans theoretical. This is trans theoretical trans theoretical stages of change. It's by Prochowski and somebody else. Okay, so what was the answer for that one? Engage the social worker with discussions on what his life would be like without his behavior problems. He's contemplating. He is an A. Very good. He is an A. He's thinking about it. He is thinking about it. That's contemplation. I'm just thinking about it. Okay. Positive regard. 
So positive regard does belong to Carl Rogers, especially my clinical level people. Carl Rogers, client-centered therapy, right? He came along after Freud. Freud said that the, the therapist was the expert and you poor stupid women knew nothing. Look at these cards and these ink blots and I'll tell you what it means, right? Carl Rogers came along and always think of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, right? Because everything is okay, boys and girls in the neighborhood. So Carl Rogers really was client-centered. The client was right, okay? And if we supported them enough, then we could actually, they could figure out their own problems. So his terms are congruence. That means everything lines up. My words and my body are lined up. They're congruent. If they're non-congruent, uncongruent, they're not matching, then you believe the body, not the lips. Okay? Hips don't lie. That's what Shakira said, right? Okay, so congruence though, everything lines up. That's what, uh, that's, again, that's a Carl Rogers approach. Warmth, genuineness, and positive regard. Unconditional positive regard is what Carl Rogers said. Okay, so look at 115. You got it, that is D, accepting and supporting clients regardless of their actions and statements. So if you ever see the test on the test, um, especially again, the clinical level, if I'm looking at, um, I've got a group of drug users and I can use any theoretical orientation I would like. Carl Rogers is not the best choice, right? Because with our drug users who are always, always in denial, as well as our pedophiles who are always in denial, Positive regard won't make them, won't help them see their own issues, right? So, not won't work with my druggies. Okay, one sixteen. Which of the following perspectives on human behavior is based on the belief that clients have the capacity to change themselves, actions by a desire for growth, personal meaning, and competence? My humanistic approach is going to be like my Carl Rogers and also Maslow, Maslow High Degree of Needs. Okay, that, those are my um, human, humanistic people. Uh, when it comes to Maslow, let me remind you, he's actually known, everyone knows his for like the, the deficits we have, right? So it's called a motivational theory. Okay, so we're motivated to get to the top of the pyramid. The ones at the bottom, those are called my, those are deficits. Those are my B needs, my basics, right? I need um, psychological, I need food, warmth, I need a place to sleep, lay my head, all those things. That's the bottom. Then safety, and then belonging and love, uh, esteem, and then self-actualization. He said very few people get to self-actualization, even if they get there, many times they don't stay there. Okay? But he did say our, our physiological needs were the most important. Those are the basics that we need to survive. When it comes to safety, remember, that doesn't always mean personal safety. It can also mean job safety. So you might see a question about a family and dad's worried about his job, okay? According to Maslow, so, you know, he can't get to the next step because he's worried about his safety, okay? So make sure you look at all of those things. And again, the B needs, the bottom, that's a hierarchy. That's a hierarchy of things that I need, okay? Back to that question. So then developmental theorists are Erickson, Piaget, Freud. They believe that you developed, okay? Psychodynamic is always going to be anything unconscious, right? Anything Freudian is psychodynamic or psychoanalytic. They're used interchangeably. In truth, psychoanalytic was what Freud first started. It was a very long theory. And psychodynamic is what happened when insurance came in. So we can only have it this long, right? So same thing though, everything's the unconscious. I'm looking for anything unconscious when I'm looking for that. Rational choice, I'm not really sure who that belonged to. We could talk about um, uh, reality therapy by Glasser, but I'm pretty sure that's not what they're looking for. Okay, so humans have the capacity to change themselves and actions are driven by desire for growth is going to be A, humanistic, right? That talks about both Carl Rogers, because the humans have what they need, and then Maslow, because we're trying to get up that chart. Okay.
119, which of the following is not a respondent behavior by a client? So I'm sure that you all know that, but I'm going to go over it just in case, you know, the two of you that don't know it, right? So that is a classical conditioning question. Classical condition is Pavlov. And Pavlov talked about us pairing behaviors. Okay, so what he said was, my body is going to do things naturally. That's an unconditioned response. Okay, so then, okay, so the dog began to salivate. Dogs do that. So we have feelings, we have fears, all of those things that were unconditioned, right? So before I had kids, I could hear the word mama, 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 in the grocery store a million times. Did it phase me? It did not. Those words didn't mean a thing. Now that I'm a mom, even if I know my kids are at home and I hear mama, 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 my, my heart's beating or I'm looking like, oh my gosh. Okay. I already had that feeling. I already had this, the anxiety or the scare, the, whatever it has, it was, I already had it. That's a natural body response. So that's an unconditioned response, my you are. However, when I had children and I knew that mommy, my, mommy, 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 and the scream mommy means something, I have paired that. So then my response is paired to something. And that's a stimulus. So I have an unpaired response, unpaired stimulant, unconditioned. And then when I will have kids and I learn that when my baby cries, something's happening. I paired those two. So that's all the dog did. He took something that was un, and his response was unpaired. This dog's doing it anyway. It's a natural body function. That, that's your response. And all he's doing is comparing it to something so then you can feel that feeling when this happens. Okay? So that is my um, condition. That's uh, classical conditioning. Most often I talk about your phone. So your cell phone, if you uh, have a different ringtone for other people, okay? So then you're like, oh, this means this, this means that, or even the name, the name, right? So on my phone, if it says, uh, you know, um, the doctor's office and I've just left, that triggers panic, right? So the pan, I already had the feeling of panic. I just paired it with seeing that doctor's phone number, okay? That's, that's what classical condition looks like. So now back to the question, which the following is not a respondent behavior. Something my body does by itself. Okay, D is correct. Walking away from someone when angry. You got it. Okay, got it. So that is not a natural response. My natural response is to punch someone when I'm angry, right? So I have to learn new behavior. <laughs> okay, 120, ego strengths. Okay, so remember id, ego, and super ego. Let's go remind us of those. My it is my pleasure principle. Uh oh, my ego, my it is what I want, I want, I want, I want, I want it now, right? That's my id. Okay, the id is the devil made me do it. Okay, so Freud said everything is in my unconscious. He did say there were some things in my pre conscious. Subconscious is never the right choice. Pre conscious, though, is things that I can recall by myself pretty easily. But everything else is in the unconscious. Those were all where all your self, your, all, your defense mechanisms were, by the way, in your unconscious. So my it, pleasure principle, I want, I want, I want, I want it now. My ego is the reality, okay? But the problem is my id and my super ego are always fighting, okay? So, and some of you may have a much stronger super ego than I have, but my id most often wants to win. It likes what it likes. The devil made me do it. That's my id. I want, I want, I want. Freud said that our id was our, our is, is its instinct, right? 
eat, sleep, and procreate. And if I can't do, if I don't do those three, eat, sleep, and procreate, then there's a problem, right? Okay, because society won't go on if we don't eat, sleep, and procreate. That's why it's called instinctual. Okay, so what he said, according to his stages of growth, oral, anal, latency, sexual, I mean, OAPLG. Okay, so what he said in his stages was that in my oral stage, um, and remember, oral, the first two stages of Freud line up with the first two stages of Erickson. Okay, so in my oral stage, that is when I was being breastfed. And if I got fixated there, right, that I wouldn't, I'd be stuck forever putting stuff in my mouth. Because my mother pulled a nipple out of my mouth too soon. So I'd be ever like stuck putting stuff in my mouth. So we were born with our id. Okay, that's my basic instinct. My um, ego develops because if my ego doesn't develop, you know, it develops, but it doesn't have a lot of use in the, or in the first stages, he said. Okay, oral, I'm stuck there putting things. If I get fixated as an adult, I'm putting things in my mouth. Anal. He said, then if I get fixated in the anal stage, my mother takes me off the potty too soon, then my sphincter muscle is too tight. So of course, I really live the rest of my life with a very tight sphincter muscle, right? A little stubborn, those kind of people. Phallic, of course, that is when I began to discover my private parts. Hey, wait, these are great. Okay, three to six is your phallic. So your Oedipus contract, that's Oedipus is my boys because they're in love with their mama and Electra is for the girls who live with their dad. Uh, in the Oedipus complex, the boy is afraid of castration. They'll come off and cut off his penis and dad'll find out, right? And the girl in Electra complex, she is also then, uh, she's, she wants, uh, she's penis envy because she wants a penis like her dad. OAP are the only three that are sexual development stages latency nothing happens and then genital of course is when you're an adult any question about masturbation is always going to be in my phallic stage adult sex well sex in general is going to be my genital stage okay but so in those stages my ego again developed but didn't have a big purpose so once i realized how good my privates felt oh the super ego develops so my id says touch 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 it feels good my super ego says, no, 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 you'll get hair on your palms. Never, never, never. That's when the ego developed, according to Freud, and the ego came about. That's your reality principle. Okay, so that's how you deal with your, your the in the ego. So ego strengths are then, that allows my ego to make the choice and not my id or my super ego. So the ego, good ego strengths are able to make good choices. Okay, that is Freud. Oral, anal, phallic, latents in general. OAPLG, orphan and a pretty little girl. I've heard old ass people love gold. This one says old age pensioners love grapes. How it works for you? OAPLG. That is a little bit of Freud there. Back to that question. So, which is following is not an indicator of an ego strength. Blaming others, exactly. So my, my it's taken over if it's blaming others, right? Wasn't me, it was you, it was you, it was you. Ego strength, it means that I am, I'm, my ego is good. I can fight, I can survive. Okay, so when it comes to group development, make sure that you know um, the order. So it, it really depends on, sometimes I'll see, this is the Boston model or the, um, or Yalom's model, or you might see Tuckman's model which is the norming, the you form, you storm, you norm, okay? It doesn't matter which one you've learned, you just need to know the order, okay? The goal of group therapy is that in the beginning, the social worker has to work a lot, oh my gosh, because she's trying to get the group formed and she's trying to help encourage the rules. By the time they're in the performing or the working stage, you do very little. Really, the clients are able to, to kind of sanction each other, okay? So if you see a question that talks about the, the, you know, the clients have been meeting for two or three weeks and they are still confronting the social worker or they're still fighting with each other. They're still in either the working stage or the power and control stage, depending on I mean, so which theory you're using. But at that point, the assumption is they'll, they'll get out of it, right? 
because that's a normal stage of group. So if you see, you know, the question that, um, you know, the, she's a new client, uh, she's a, a young social worker, and she goes to her boss because the, the, everyone keeps fighting and it's only week two, it's normal. Okay, so we're going to form, create affiliation, right? Then we're going to storm, that's our conflict. Like, oh my goodness, you sat here last week, you always make coffee, oh my gosh, all of those things, right? Then we're going to able to then um, norming, storming, for a four, I'm sorry, forming, storming, norming. We set the norm rules, right? The rules of the group, okay? Not by me, because remember, I'm at this point, I'm stepping back. The group is trying to run itself. Then we're going to perform, and then we're going to leave, okay? So those are Tuckman. So again, it doesn't matter which one you learned. The steps are still always the same, okay? Um, and um, remember, confidentiality, that stays in group. If a client says to you in group, you know, something about abusing their child, you will address them after group and remind them that, you know, there's something you need to report, things like that. Um, but if it's an in group, it needs to be addressed back in group. The group is, uh, is one, okay? If you get the client, the question about a client who, um, who um, uh, called, or, or you find out a client has shared group information, what do you do? You can't kick them out of group. In the next session, you're just gonna remind the clients of confidentiality, okay? There's that question about um, you're in a group session and the uh, a a member that shares with the group that he um, killed his ex-wife three years ago. What do you do? Okay, you can't report that, can you? You cannot, we only get to report if someone is in imminent danger of hurting themselves or someone else, I can't report what you did before. Rules of confidentiality still apply. However, most often the question, the answer is, you're going to address the client's feelings. Because he just dropped a bomb. We're going to ask how the clients are doing. Okay? So the option sometimes is remind the clients of group confidentiality. Uh-uh, he just dropped this big old bomb. I need to make sure that the group is okay first. But I cannot share that. That is, that is not the scope of, of confidentiality. It just says imminent danger of hurting themselves or someone else. Got it? So my answer to 121. Pre-affiliation, power and control, which is my storming, intimacy, differentiation, separation, and termination. The answer is C. One twenty-two is um, transvestic disorders. What is true about transvestic disorders? It is D, you got it. Sexual arousal must reform from cross-dressing. So the client, if you're not able to become aroused without cross-dressing, that becomes one of our paraphilic disorders, right? Those are all those sexual dysfunctions, paraphilia. Um, while I'm here, let me just go ahead and touch on the difference between orientation and gender, right? My gender, so gender dysphoria is for euphoria is happiness. Gender dysphoria is I'm not happy with, with what I was assigned at birth. So I was born with a vagina, but I believe that I was a male. That I should be a male. That's gender dysphoria, that there's something wrong with my gender assignment. Okay. So then with, with uh, my gender assignment, then what I'm looking at is um, if I choose to live, if I'm a female and I still have my vagina, but I believe I'm a male and I refer to myself as a, a male, then I am transgender. Before I've had the surgery, I am transgender. Transsexual is after I've had the surgery. Okay. So I've had sexual reassignment surgery and now I'm called, I'm considered transsexual. So transgender is before, transsexual is after. Those are only gender issues though. It has nothing to do with my sexual orientation, which is then who I choose to have sex with. Okay, gender, whether I have a penis vagina, I'm a boy or a girl. Okay, dysphoria, don't like it, we reassigned. Okay, transsexual is after you've had the assignment surgery. 
So a couple of terms like non-binary, um, that's the pronoun they, which I'm not really sure I agree with. No one ever asked me though, but they's plural. So he, she, and they, I don't know. But so they is a pronoun for people who um, are non-binary, choosing not to pick a side. Okay. Um, so then uh, if you get a question about, um, you know, are there heterosexual, or homosexual, what matters is their current gender. Okay, so their current gender, if they had a surgery, if they identify as male and they're attracted to other males, then they're gay. If they used to be a man and now they're a woman and they're attracted to men, they are straight. So orientation, what you do in your bedroom, gender, what you have between your legs. Okay. One twenty-three DTs. Delirium tremors. Who do those belong to? That is correct. Physical symptoms associated with alcohol withdrawal. You got it. DTs are extremely dangerous. If a client reports to you that they've been using heavily and they're trying to stop, that is a medical issue. You can die from, from the delirium tremors. It's a, a, a physical as well as psychological addiction to alcohol. So you're gonna get a seek and medical help immediately. Um, other drug use, opioid use of opioid withdrawal is not fun, but you won't die. Okay, so opioids are my heroin, you know, the um, um, prescription drugs, things like that. So um, I will not die though. The only one that really will kill me are, are DTs. Open, open with opioid withdrawal um, is like a um, awful, awful flu for a couple of days. And many times people do it in, in detox or even in prison. Again, that was B. Let's go to 125. A client reports that she repeatedly feels the urge to physically strike her child when angry, tells those workers she's having trouble moving her arm. The client is exhibiting what? That is a conversion disorder. That's in my line of somatoform disorders. Soma means body, right? So anything, anything that's a physical, I'm sorry, mental, any mental or emotional problem that comes out as a physical problem is gonna be a somatoform disorder. That's where I get that malingering and fictitious disorder, right? So under the umbrella of somatoform disorders, okay, so again, soma means body, okay. My conversion disorder, so that is a neurological issue. So something traumatic has happened. When you're looking at those, it's always gonna be some trauma. Something traumatic has happened and suddenly they can't use part of their body, okay. So that's my, my conversion disorder. Um, they, they saw a child get hit and killed by a car and now they can't see. They can't hear because of something. You're gonna look for trauma in the questions, okay? Um, somatoform, somatization disorder overall just means I, there's some, some, I'm complaining about something in my body. Um, um, BD, BDD, that body disforming disorder, that's when you believe there's something hideously wrong with your body. Michael Jackson supposedly had that one. Um, so malingering, malingering is you are deliberately faking it on purpose. You're trying to get out of something. A client comes to you two days before he has to go to court and suddenly he says he's depressed. Okay, that is malingering. My factitious disorders are, are you are faking. Okay, not really sure what the purpose is. Okay. So fictitious disorders and malingering are the two that we must see, we must see you'll see the most often. Um, with my um, fictitious disorders, you're going to get that primary and secondary gain. 
The primary gain, we're not sure what the cause is that. I mean, I'm not sure what that is. The primary gain is on the inside. No one can see what gain you're getting from this. My secondary gain, of course, then, um, is my someone you can see. It's obvious what I'm getting from this. So I get the doctor's attention. I, I get attention. My, my child gets attention. Something like that. That's a secondary gain. Primary gains when it comes to, again, factitious or com uh, conversion disorders. Inside, I don't know what you're getting. Secondary gains are obvious what you're getting. And then my tertiary gains, they affect other people. So whatever I'm getting affects other people. So the moms who fake their kids that have cancer and their whole family gets to go to Disney, tertiary gain. Okay, those are my somatoform disorders. Go to the windows here. Okay, I lost my thing. Okay, I'm going to pause just for a minute and go for questions.